Hello and welcome to School Health Presents Holistic Transitioning. I'm Dr. Ray Height, and in this video, we're going to be focused on some final thoughts. This is our 10th episode and our final episode in this particular video series. We began this in mid-May with the idea of moving us from where we were in May to at least giving us ideas of how we could get through the summer and get to the point we're at right now. We're at the beginning of August. And so we're already looking at transitioning back into the classroom or at least transitioning back into learning as we see it in the fall. I recognize that still there are a lot of decisions that are going to be made. Some districts are not going back now until after Labor Day. Some districts have opted to go the first nine weeks, so the first quarter essentially, in a remote setting. Others have decided to go hybrid or give parents the option of either face-to-face -face or remote types of learning. And there's some schools that, within that whole idea of going hybrid, they will still have students in their buildings every single day, but it'll be different groups and done in a proper social distancing format. You know, there is a quote that we've got here in orange right now from Confucius. And that quote is that success depends upon previous preparation. And that's what we've been looking to do throughout the context of this video series. I know there's still a lot of questions out there. No one has full answers. But one of the great things that we're seeing on the education side is the differentiated understanding of where learning takes place and how it can take place. Why do I share that? Why do I emphasize those points? Well, because learning can take place anywhere. We've known that for a long period of time. In working with our exceptional students, there are certain things that we've got to be doing when we're working together with them. We're creating routines. We're allowing them to grow and develop just like any neurotypical student might be, but they're doing it at their own pace. And so as we continue to move forward, we want to make sure we are creating lessons that can be used in any particular situation, but still be able to have us move forward with what we're doing. You know, the first point that we must make is that we can only control what we can control. And I know right now there's a lot of turmoil. Teachers, I understand exactly where you're coming from with a concern going back into the classroom. How does it affect your health? How does it affect the health of those students. Administrators, I've been there. I understand what we're trying to deal with right now. We've got pressures coming on us from a variety of different places. How are we still going to be those leaders, those principal teachers, as we move through what's coming up? So what can we control? As teachers, here's what you can control first and foremost. You can control what goes on in your classrooms. You can control the lessons. You can control the learning. You can control things like creating those healthy habits. You've heard me emphasize time and time again, we've got to work on hand washing. That's something that the greater populace really needs to understand. And in this day and age, it is so essential and so important. Another thing we want to be aware of is social distancing. Yes, there are kids. There are ways that we can get our kids to stay apart. Here's the ironic thing. Within the context of social distancing, it's also creating some social ideas and social mores of how we need to move forward. With this idea of social distancing, recognize that we're teaching a level of appropriate interaction. And by doing it with our exceptional students, along with our neurotypical students, we are hoping to move away from some of the issues that we've seen over the last few years. So we can only control what we can control, but in that classroom, we can control what's going on. Administrators, you can control what's happening with the learning in your building, in your district. Notice I said with the learning, not specifically in your building, because some of you may be doing hybrid forms of learning. Some of you may be doing remote learning for the early part. That's okay, because what we want to do is be best prepared for that learning side of things. Because if we're preparing, and we're preparing with the idea that what happens if all of a sudden we have to go fully remote again, 
then we have the ability to transition from one form to another quickly. We didn't have that in March when all of a sudden things got chaotic. Teachers, administrators, you did a great job trying to adjust. I know many of the parents out there still felt some frustrations as to what was going on, but recognize that so many districts did outstanding work with how they actually handled things. And a critical piece along with that is communication. You'll hear me talking about communication through all of this. So schools, please continue to communicate with the parents on administrative ideas, on teaching ideas. Teachers, have an email that goes out to the parents on a regular basis. Have a place on a website that you can be communicating something as simple as what we did today. Why? Because now everyone's on the same page as we begin to move forward. The next thing, if we're preparing for that remote idea, is that if we're using videos or we're using documents, realize that those can also be used in a face-to-face -face setting. How can they be used that way? For those of us in the Midwest or up in the Northeast or even out in the Plain States, we have emergency days that are in the old days were called snow days where we just it was unsafe for the kids to actually be coming into the buildings it was unsafe for the teachers to try and get into the buildings we don't have those anymore you know why because now we know how to connect with our students we know that we can actually share things with them that they could be doing at home critical piece though in this idea of communication Who's got internet access? Because that's an assumption we can't afford to be wrong on. Some of our students don't have that. Another important piece in that communication is how many computers are at home and do other people have to access them? So be aware of some of those things, but that's the communication that must go on at the very beginning. But again, as we're creating things, we can now have no more emergency days just days where we shift from face-to-face -face learning to remote and then back again. Also, teachers, when you're going to be out, you're going to be at a conference, so let's say that you're ill and you're at home. Guess what? It's not the old-fashioned lesson plans in the top left-hand desk drawer that you open and pull out the file. Now it's a scenario where you can still be teaching. You can have videos that the students need to access or documents additional readings that are able to be pulled in and the students can do it right from the classroom right where they're at that substitute teacher can come in and be a support mechanism and continue the learning where it needs to go so if we're preparing things and we're thinking remote don't just think oh my gosh it we're stuck in this pandemic over and over it's like groundhog day no i realize it feels like that However, if we're thinking about, no, this is allowing us to take our learning to another step, that changes how we approach the lessons, that changes how we approach the learning too. We also wanna take a look at ourselves. How do we best learn something? It's been very interesting because as I've had the opportunity to talk with teachers, to talk with administrators, there's been a lot of additional reading that's been done. Parents, as you're watching this, some of you are in school districts that have done wonderful things. Some of you are in school districts where you've got your concerns. One of the things you need to recognize is that teachers have really been actually doing about twice the amount of work that they normally do. Why? Because they've had to change things up. Even if they're just sending home what one district calls bubble packs to their kids, and it's basically materials because they know those students don't have computers or they know those students don't have access to things. Even if they're doing it, there's still the preparation time that needs to go into that, and there's a differentiated way of approach. So as we're moving forward and we're thinking about that, think about how we best learn. So many, again, of our individuals have said, listen, I did a lot more reading. Okay, how did you read? Did you physically pick up a book? Did you read things online? Did you read things off your tablet or iPad? How were you reading? And how can that be translated into daily living skills? This is a cell phone. However, for some of our exceptional individuals, this is your AAC device and a way to FaceTime or do video conferencing with others. 
seeing that face, communicating in a very social and personal way. This is also a device that allows you to carry documents from place to place or create new documents. This can also be a device for those with visual impairments that helps them get information that's on a text that can't be easily read and have it released to us auditorily. This is a device that replaces 50 pound backpacks. We call it a cell phone. There's so many new things that we can be doing with this, again, if we're thinking in the right way. So how do we learn? And how can we take those things that we've learned about ourselves or we learned about our learning and apply it that way? What have some of us learned? That we're tired of Zoom meetings. Why are we tired of Zoom meetings? Because it seemed like every day there were 17 of them that had to go on. Well, guess what? Our kids may ex experience that in different ways too. Also, guess what? Our kids that only have access to a single computer and you've got three or four students and a parent at home trying to access things or our students that don't have the internet at home can't do that. So how do we make adjustments? What can we do to work with them? So how do we learn and how can we apply that and how can we work with our individuals based on where they are at to bring things directly to them? Communicate, communicate, communicate. Talk to the parents, find out, do they have internet? How many computers do they have? Do they have other kids? Talk to the parents about what they feel comfortable supporting their students with. This is not the old fashioned days where you'd have a student come home and say, oh, new math. There was always an excuse you heard, wasn't it? Oh, it's new math. No, math is numbers. But our understanding of those numbers vary. And in the same way, what are the parents comfortable supporting their students with? What are they not comfortable supporting their students with too so that we can make adjustments as we go through? Administrators, you've been in a tough bind because you've been trying to make sure that your teachers are best supported, your students are best supported, and you gotta wait, whether it be from a governor or a state or local department of health to give you some direction in that. Communicate on a regular basis. It's okay to say, we don't know, here's what we're waiting on, because that's communication. Otherwise, people are like, what are you hiding? So communicate, communicate, communicate. That's the only way we're gonna do this together and that's a source of so many problems that we've got today in our society. We just don't communicate. Finally, videos, online classrooms. We've got all kinds of things that are popping up whether you're looking at them on Twitter. And please expand your PLNs because that is an important thing share ideas, connect with other teachers that are going through the same things and are dealing with students that are very similar to yours because no two students are the same and there's no one size fits all. But connect, get ideas between those groups. Why is that important? Because then we can apply it. We can begin to say, hey, I'm gonna take this and this and actually adapt. But as we're going through, realize that all those things that are online work. Why do they work? Because of you. Because you're the one that's making it work. Because you're the one that's making the adjustments. We have studies that we've seen about master teachers. A true master teacher in the classroom makes a critical decision once every 30 seconds. That's 90 decisions in a 45 minute class period. What are those decisions on? About the learning, about individual students, about the temperature in the room, about whatever but they're critical decisions that allow for continued success of the students. Make those critical decisions now. Make those critical decisions based on what's worked. Oh, and by the way, don't forget what didn't work and make sure you build that in too. And don't hand me a oh, remote learning just didn't work. There's a heck of a lot of districts that remote learning added a depth and dimension. Why is it important still to have face-to-face -face when it's healthy and safe to have face-to-face -face because we need that social interaction. We need to, the, the coming together of the students and that dynamic, that, that social interaction with teachers, with aides, with administrators, with everyone actually creates. But the online things work because of you. Stay positive, stay focused, understand that nobody's got an answer. There's no quick fix. However, 
the hero who's riding in, if you want to say the hero who rides in on the horse or is wearing the shining armor or anything like that, that's you. You are that hero. You are the person that's been doing a lot of work. Parents, you are the heroes too because you've had to adjust as you go through by communicating, by working together, and by continuing to move forward and saying we are all in this together instead of putting blame on this, that, or the other thing. Think about it. We're putting blames on viruses. We're putting blames on politicians. We're putting blames on whomever. All we're doing is we are moving into a scenario where we're not focusing on what's best. So what we want to do and what I hope this has helped you really start to focus in on doing are some techniques to actually say, hey, guess what? We can approach learning in such a different way, a way we've never approached it in the past. And the great thing about that is we, each one of us individually, is the hero that will bring this to a wonderful conclusion because our exceptional students and our neurotypical students will come through this. I just spoke with a very good colleague of mine at the university level. And she had some great insight, and that was this. As she is preparing her students, her education students, for going out into the real world, she is so excited because this particular cohort that they've got right now has experienced learning in a vastly different way. And she said they are already coming up with ideas of how their classrooms can be different in the future. Different but in some ways still staying within the boundaries of focus on the learning, focus on the students, focus on that environment in a system along the way. If you have questions, if you have other thoughts or ideas and you want to contact me, please reach out rheipp at schoolhealth.com. I'm there to assist you as we go through things. On August the 12th, we do have a webinar with Dr. Maria Franklin from the University of Maine. She's going to be speaking on, again, some of the psychological issues that our kids will be experiencing as they come back into the classroom. Also, we'll be doing some things with Closing the Gap. Please make sure you're staying up with your professional conferences and that because so many of them are virtual and online and are doing great things. Anything we can do to support you, we are here for you. You are the heroes. We are all in this together. And guess what? Education is moving on, and education is taking a shape and format that will assist our students, especially our exceptional students, for many years to come. Thank you for all that you're doing, and I'll see you somewhere down the road.